Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you whenever and wherever you're watching from right now. My name is Pastor Grant and this is online worship with First Christian Church in Sullivan, Illinois. I speak for all of our church family when I say that thank you for joining us, whether it's your first time or your hundredth time. We welcome you also to join us anytime in person for worship on Sundays at 10 a.m. Our online gathering here will give you a window into who we are, but you can also check out our website at www.sullivan.church. Now let's quiet our hearts and minds as we enter into a time of worship. Let's pray. God, I thank you for each person participating in online worship right now. I ask that you guide our time together. Please speak to us through your Holy Spirit. May all who join this, join us, be encouraged, inspired, and blessed. Amen. It is important that we take some time during worship to lift others in prayer to God. And that, that may mean praying for specific people or situations or circumstances. During in-person worship on Sundays, we share these things aloud, but online we keep them private for the sake of privacy. However, if you have a specific request or concern, you can share that aloud where you are right now, or you can send it along to me via email, grant at FCCSullivan.org. Let's pray. Dear God, we are so fortunate to be gathered by you to hear the good news. We celebrate that we are a community of people, each at different point on our faith journeys, each seeking your healing love and mercy. We are called to witness to the good news of Jesus who taught us about your love for each one of us and for your magnificent creation. But there are those for whom this word seems a distant hope or experience. They struggle with the difficulties of everyday living, with addictions or illnesses or alienation. So help us to bring the good news to them in gentle kindness and compassionate understanding. Let our actions and attitudes reflect all that Jesus taught. For just a moment, we take a breath and we remember those that we love who are in difficult experiences right now as we pray silently. Lord, you hear the cries of your people, and so we ask for your healing mercies on all whom we lift before you now. We also ask for your healing in our own lives. Keep our hearts open to your love. Help us to be witnesses of your mercy and hope wherever you place us. Thank you for the grace that you have given to us through Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. on nothing less than Jesus Christ my righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but only lean on Jesus name on Christ the side rock I stand on other ground is sinking sand on other Darkness fails his lovely face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my 
tiger holds within the veil On Christ the side Our past days All of the ground is sinking sand All of the ground is sinking sand Support me in the whelming flood When all around my soul gives way He then is all my hope and stay On Christ the solid rock I stand on As the ground is sinking sand sound oh, oh may I let in him be found in him my righteousness alone will fall is to stand before the Today's scripture reading comes to us from the book of Acts. We're going to look at chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. So let's listen now together to the word of the Lord. All of the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. May God add blessings to the reading, hearing, and understanding of this word today. Today we're starting a new sermon series in which we're going to uh, seek to contrast the virtual communities in which many of us participate with the kind of community that the Bible calls us to nurture and to maintain. Now, I don't want you to worry, you don't have to be a social media user to understand what I'm talking about, although I would imagine if you're watching this online, especially if you're watching via YouTube, then I kind of already know the answer, right? But I believe that these sermons are going to have some applicability for all the relationships that we have in our lives. The idea from this sermon series came from someone who, who once commented something to the effect of, you know, I'd really like to know how to deal with all those jerks I see on Facebook. And then someone else mentioned a little more timidly, well, I'd kind of like to know how not to be a jerk on Facebook. And it's not just Facebook, right? We see animosity among all the various social media platforms. 
I took a look to see what the most popular ones are these days. So I just uh, want to kind of do a quick survey and you can kind of just reflect and see how many of these social media platforms you have used. Uh, these are the most popular uh, as of the last couple of years. There's Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, Instagram, Twitter, now known as X, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Pinterest, and TikTok. Now, I would venture to guess that just about <clears throat> everybody has used at least one of these at some point or another. And if you have, you've probably noticed the kinds of communities that can be found in these virtual spaces. So let's go back to those original questions, because both are legitimate questions in this day and age. How do we maintain our Christian identity and live out Christ's example in all our relational spheres, including online? Today, I want to talk about the kind of communities in which we participate and the ones in which we contribute. So, <clears throat> for example, I'm on Facebook, and on Facebook, I'm a part of several sub-communities. They're known as groups these days, and they're focused on specific interests, right? For example, I'm a part of a disciples clergy community. So to be in this group, you have to be ordained as a disciples clergy member, and you have to prove that to be able to uh, be a part of the group. Uh, I'm also in a, a group, a community that is made up solely of uh, people who own Ford Maverick trucks. And I know that probably sounds a little bit ridiculous, but it's, it's actually pretty fascinating. And of course, you wouldn't be surprised to know that I'm in a group of people that are Chicago Cubs fans. Now, each of these groups, each of these communities is defined by uh, some commonality, a common interest. And so this, this online space or our online life together centers around that interest. So is it a stretch to call these groups communities? Well, I don't think it is. The dictionary defines a community as a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. And certainly that applies to each of the groups that I'm a part of. But I also have to be careful not to assume that those communities have the same values and benefits of a real community. You see, it's one thing to know someone virtually, right? But it's quite another thing to know them in real life or IRL, as the kids say these days. And you see, it's also important for us to realize that our online communities, while having the appearance of being uh, very free-flowing and inclusive, they allow us an opportunity to cultivate a collection of people who will only support our current worldview. That's really how I, I see Twitter in a lot of ways these days. At least that's how I used to use it. I'm not on there anymore. But like <clears throat> if someone on Facebook posts something that I disagree with, I have the option. I can choose to hide that post. I can hide all of their posts or I can choose to just unfriend them all together. I mean, I can easily choose with whom I do and don't interact. Our online communities give us control over who we let in and who we decide we want to keep out. But that's not always the case. Uh, once you leave the chat room, right? Don't you wish real life was like that sometimes, like Facebook? I mean, wouldn't it be great if everyone walked around with a little block button on their forehead so that as soon as they started to say something that you disagree with, you could just hit that button? But being in real community with each other, it means we have to figure out how to live together in the midst of our differences, instead of just blocking the people who aren't like us. And I think that's the picture that we find in Acts chapter 2. This passage is painting a picture for us. It's a snapshot of the early church and it, it doesn't talk about uh, parking lot conversations and contentious congregational meetings. Instead, it's a picture of harmony as early Christians devoted themselves to being the people that God called them to be. They learned together, they fellowshiped together, they shared stuff together, they, they broke bread together, they prayed together, they praised God together, they grew together. Those early believers really seemed to know how to be and do church, didn't they? But don't be fool, fooled. Uh, this was a church, right? So there's no way that everyone got along. What Acts chapter 2 doesn't tell us is that the first time the early church held a board meeting, there was a huge argument over what color carpeting to put in the sanctuary and what kind of bread they were going to use at communion. And before you know it, 
Apostle so-and-so moved half the congregation to the next village to start his own flock. Okay, well, maybe we're ad-libbing a little bit there. The Apostle Paul, though, writing about his disagreement with Peter, says, When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. I mean, can you just imagine that? Peter and Paul, finger-pointing, just bumping. I say the carpet shall be fuchsia. Well, I say God wants it to be aqua. I think, I hope we can admit that the church doesn't always get community right. We don't always do it well. And when you look at all of the disagreements down through church history, many of them center on the one fundamental question. And it's the same question that's used to define our online communities. Who is in and who is out? That was at the core of the disagreement between Paul and Peter. They're arguing over circumcision, and it was at the core of many of Luther's charges against the, the Catholic Church. Who's in and who's out? The problem is, the Bible is not real clear on this. Are divorced people in or out? Are uncircumcised Gentiles in or out? Are gays in or out? Are sinners or tax collectors in or out? Are women in or out? The list goes on and on and on. Christians make arguments on both sides of any issue based on scripture, and of course that's not real helpful. We want clarity so we know where we can draw the lines. In our communities, we want to know who's in and who's out. I remember hearing a story from a friend of mine who used to uh, golf at a course that was right next to a farm. <clears throat> he said that the farmer was apparently not a golf fan because he had posted along the fence line separating the course from the farm was a series of signs that simply said private property and then it showed a picture of a shotgun. I suppose that's a pretty clear message, right? My, my friend said, I can't tell you how many golf balls I hit across that fence line, but I can tell you how many of them I retrieved. Zero. See, the farmer made it very clear who was allowed in and who wasn't. And that's the kind of definitive clarity we seek in the Bible. These people are in, these people are out. Wouldn't it be easier if Jesus gave us some guidance on this? Instead, Jesus says things like, love your enemies and, and blessed are the peacemakers. And then he leaves us to work out the details in community with each other. And unfortunately, we're not always so good at that. I mean, spend just a few minutes on Facebook and you'll find plenty of people who hate and exclude. And you'll probably find some people you want to hate and exclude. I mean, maybe we're going about this all wrong. Maybe we're using the wrong criteria to define who's in and who's out of our community. I read a story once about how ranchers in Australia control their flocks. Because the size of land they own is so huge, they can't just build fences. It's too impractical, too costly. So instead of building a big fence, they dig down into the earth and they build a well, providing precious water in the dusty outback. Animals then won't stray too far from their water source, so instead of fencing their borders, the ranchers draw the flocks to the center. <clears throat> so rather than building fences, maybe we should be digging wells. And instead of trying to decide who's in and who's out of our communities, maybe we should dig a well, set a table, extend an invitation, and just see who shows up. The early church didn't draw lines. They shared what they had with each other. <clears throat> and everyone was invited to the fellowship picnics, and everyone was invited to Sunday school, and everyone was invited to the table. I think the table is our well. Drawing people to the center of our faith, which is Jesus Christ. Our community is, is not centered around a sports team or, or a type of truck. Jesus is our center, and everything that we say and do should reflect that. That may be the one thing we've continued to get right. Everyone is welcome at the table. Yes, Judas. Yes, you. No criteria, no interest exams, no determination of spiritual fitness. It's this, you all, all, y'all come, invitation. It's this lavish extension of radical hospitality where everyone is in and no one is out. It's a famous poem by Edwin Markham. He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. Christ has drawn a circle and we are all within it.
That doesn't mean we have to agree with everyone who comes into our circle. In fact, I think our community is made stronger by the diversity of beliefs that we can contain within it. The beauty of who we are, or at least who we are striving to be, is that there is room for every voice here. We don't all have to believe the same things. We don't all have to vote the same way to be a part of this family. We are included by virtue of the one who drew the circle, the one whose love, like a circle, has no beginning, no end, Jesus. You see, online you can choose who's in and who's out of your community. But what about in real life? What about in the communities to which God calls us? Who's in? Well, everybody is in. That person that thinks differently than you, yep, they're in. The person who forwards you every single email with pictures of cute kittens, they're in. The person who, whose political perspective is both wrong and obnoxious, they're in. And that jerk on Facebook, yep, he's in too. The person who roots for the other team than your team, well, yeah, they're in. We may have strong opinions about who we believe should be in and who should be out. That's okay, because we're human, and so we're not going to like everybody. In fact, there's probably one person, maybe more than one person, who thinks that you shouldn't be in. How about that? You see, it's a good thing God's drawing the circle and not them, isn't it? Because when God draws the circle, there's room. There's room for me, there's room for you, there's room for everyone, everybody. How big are the circles we draw? Is there room for everyone? The world has enough people who want to build fences. Maybe, maybe God will give us the grace to be people who dig wells instead. Let's pray. God, in your word, we find that we are challenged to stretch ourselves, to go out of our comfort zone, to think beyond this earthly realm. God, so often we are caught up in the divisiveness of the day-to-day and the divisiveness of our world, and yet we see that you are a God who knows no division, no boundaries. God, you welcome us all at your table. We are all in your circle because you created all of us in your image. God, help us to carry forward that kind of radical love. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our time of offering is helpful for us to commit ourselves to God's service. In this time, we celebrate God's blessings, recognizing that God has called us to love and give and serve others as he leads us. So we thank you for your continued support of the work and ministry of FCC through your gifts that you give either online, through the mail, or when you're in person on Sundays. May you also carry forth this spirit of generosity into the world around you. Would you join me in prayer now over our offerings that are represented among us? Let's pray. God, we bring our gifts to you and offer them as a symbol of sacrifice and service. We seek to share the story of love that fulfills and conquers death. Bless these gifts that we give now and all who give. Use our offerings, our time, our abilities for the good of all your people. Amen. As we prepare now for our time of communion, I trust that you've gathered elements that you may use to participate. If not, you can pause the video right now and go grab something. It doesn't have to be the traditional bread and grape juice as we use on Sundays. We participate in this act of communion, remembering and celebrating Christ's victory over death. Through his sacrifice, we are promised life anew. So as you partake today, accept completely the love and forgiveness that God offers to you. All are welcome to this meal as Christ has invited us. You may consume of the elements at any point that you feel led during this next piece of music. Let my desires be your desires. I want to love just like you do. Let our revival Ring out in my soul and let it echo, echo. The things in your heart are all that I want. Your will be done, your will be done. The things on your heart are all that I want. Let heaven come, let heaven come. 
brings us to the conclusion of our time together for online worship. Thank you again for joining us. I hope it was a meaningful time of worship for you. Now as you leave this place, go forth in peace and hope, for God is your guardian and guide. Bring news of God's good love to all that you meet. Amen. <laughs>